Hello, Z learners. Nice to see you and welcome to Lunch and Z Learn right here at Riverbanks Zoo and Garden. My name is Milo and today we have a very special feature all ready for all of you guys. In fact, you might be wondering, well, why am I wearing my zebra mask? Well, the zebra habitat is actually right behind me. We are inside the zoo right now. In fact, we are over at Safari Camp, which is kind of our, our big picnic shelter of areas but we're here for a very particular reason. Our entire team, every single department it seems, is getting ready for Boo at the Zoo, which officially begins on Friday evening this week. We are so excited. It is the Halloween season and we have so many exciting features to share with you for that event. It's been an annual event for a good number of years, but of course this year is a completely different year in many different ways. So. We got some exciting new features to share with you about Boo at the Zoo. And what better way for us to do that than to introduce you to some of my favorite animal ambassadors right here at Riverbank. So those of you who are tuning in live, howdy, Jonathan, nice to see you all tuning in. We got a lot of animals that we have to introduce you to. And even though I might be wearing a zebra mask, just look at it as my Halloween costume today. We're not actually gonna go hang out with our zebras and ostriches today. Instead, on our radar is Halloween themed animals. Now, I kind of put those in quotations, spooky animals, scary animals, because it all depends on who you ask. Some people think animals are scary or concerning, but you know what, let's be honest. Here at the zoo, we are here to educate you and to create those connections and maybe debunk some myths along the way. In fact, if you can think of some things that maybe you're curious about with the animals we're gonna talk about today, send in your comments. I want to see those questions because there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to spooky animals here at the zoo. Now we're going to be meeting some of our animal ambassador friends, which means we get to be up close and personal. Hi everybody. Nice to see you all tuning in live. I even saw somebody is actually here at the zoo today. So you are live during a live. That's way too much fun. But today I am joined by Alma, one of my very good friends here at the zoo. She is one of our education coordinators and she's actually going to be handling some of those animal ambassadors for us to see up close and personal. But the reason why we are here in safari camp is because once Boo at the Zoo begins, we are actually going to turn this place into a little bit of a pumpkin patch of sorts. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and get all settled though here because right in front of me is Alma with one of our friends. Let me go ahead and turn around the camera because it is very sunny all of a sudden. Alma, it is so great to see you. Nice Hi, to Mama. see you. All right, so Alma, you are joined by, ooh. This uh, is Rosie. I was gonna say, take it away. Introduce us to who yeah, we're looking at. This is Rosie. <laughs> Rosie is a chinchillin, chinchillian. Rose Tarantula, and she her. gets that gorgeous name because of her gorgeous colors. She's got this nice uh, rose, um, pink kind of coloration to her. And she does get a really sad reputation, I unfortunately. Can only but I'm going to debunk it, and one of which by doing it right now. Well, absolutely. Well, and as Alma tries to get Rosie on hand, and just so you know, leave this to the professionals. Alma is specifically trained on animal ambassador handling procedures, but take yeah. a look at her. We are going to get so up close and personal. So, How amazing. So a lot of people are really fearful of spiders in general mm -hmm. and tarantulas in particular are one of the largest species um, of spider. In fact, they are the largest. There's about 800 different species of tarantula. And these are really well known for being um, very used to people. They often are found within their homes. Wow. And um, it's not a bad thing because of what they do for the homeowner. They're kind of like a pet in many sense for those homeowners <laughs> in South America because they're going to help eat the bugs and insects that are possibly entering their home. So you either trade one tarantula for lots of critters, <laughs> okay, or lots of critters or no Exactly. Tarantula. That's a perfect way of looking yeah. at it. Well, and Chris, I just saw your question. You're absolutely correct. This is a rose-haired tarantula. Very good observation, definitely. And Raleigh, I couldn't agree more. Rosie is so pretty. In fact, Alma's doing such a good job handling this individual so we can get an up-close view. Now, 
Alma, I know a lot of times when people think of spiders in general, there's a lot of myths that come to mind and there's a lot of phobias. Sure. Arachnophobia is one of the most common phobias sure. and we would be remiss to not mention it during Z learning, especially during Halloween. They got eight legs, they're kind of hairy, they're really fast sometimes. I mean, they really do fit the bill of being a potentially creepy animal. Sure. Sure. But do we actually have anything to worry about with these animals? Typically, no. These guys are very um, harmless in the sense that she knows because she's very wise using um, something on her body to tell that I am not prey. And so therefore, she doesn't want to waste any energy in trying to catch me because I'm not food for her. So a lot of people do think these guys are harmful or deadly to humans. In fact, there are no reports ever of a human dying from a tarantula bite, okay? Shoo. Okay, good. Um, and typically that's not their form of protection for themselves. If you look really closely at her, and next to me is actually a really good demonstration of her. I've got oh, a This plush. one's a little fuzzier, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a plush tarantula, a large size one. Um, but you can see the hairs on it even better than the hairs on her. And those hairs are specifically for protecting herself from predators. So she can flick them um, up into the air and they create kind of this dust-like um, cloud. And if that gets into your eyes or your nose or your ears, if you're an animal, it's not gonna feel good. It's gonna be irritating and itchy. Um, it might even burn a little bit. Now she's not doing that to me because again, she Very knows I am no threat to her. She's exactly. just hanging out right now. She doesn't even wanna go anywhere. Well, and Alma, it's so funny that you bring that up literally right when you were saying it. Sarah Grace actually commented in and says, does she shoot her hairs when she gets scared? Sarah Grace, you're on the right page. You could be doing Alma's job right now. <laughs> it sounds like you know a lot about tarantulas. Now, Chris, I also saw your comment too of, do they really throw their hairs? Yes, they do. And they kind of rub them off. Yep. But I will say, Chris, you also mentioned like a porcupine. Very different than a porcupine. Porcupines don't throw those quills like you might expect them to. A little bit different. Definitely a creative form of defense though. I like the similarity there. Now, sure. I'll be honest, Alma, from my experience handling tarantulas, I've never had that itchy sensation that the hairs provide. Have you had that personal experience before? Uh, I have not, Milo, and I've handled a variety of different tarantulas through the years. Um, some Mexican red knees, I've handled a Brazilian black at another institution. Wow, yeah. And none of those tarantulas caused me any issues with itchy or watering eyes or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, and that's just because the animal usually tells you if it's comfortable or not, just simply by its behavior. The fact she's sitting still, the fact that she's not rubbing her back with her back legs, which is what they do when they throw those hairs up in the air. They kind of rub them off their abdomen, which this is her abdomen. You can't oh, see. Oh, in the back. Yep. Yep. You can't see it. Yep. Bit. It's way back there in the back. Um, that is what they would do with those hairs. Now, those hairs are important to her. She doesn't want to just waste them because they also help her be able to feel her way around. They actually are mainly for feeling vibrations other than for protection. And so that's how she's gonna locate her food. Instead of using a web, she uses her hairs on her body. They pick up vibrations and even temperature in the air. So she can feel if something warm is coming close to her, huh. something cold is nearby. She can actually sense the air around her to find out where is her food, where is her prey, what does she not want to run into? So that's really important as well. What a neat adaptation. Now, Stevie, I saw your comment come in a little while ago. Stevie was wondering, what do they eat? And since they have those unique adaptations for hunting, what would be a delicious snack for a tarantula? Ooh. So it de determine, that is determined by what kind of tarantula you really have. But sure. most tarantulas do like to eat a variety of insects. Yep. However, they can, the larger tarantulas eat lizards, frogs, salamanders, Whoa. even small rodents like mice, um, rats, possibly also um, if they can catch some um, birds. So um, it really just depends on the size of the tarantula and what their native prey is. For this girl, she's definitely an insect eater. Here at the zoo, we feed her crickets. Sure. She occasionally gets um, some other bugs as well, but crickets is the main part of her diet here. Um, in the wild, maybe grasshoppers. Um, Delicious. Possibly. Yeah, right? <laughs> if you're a tarantula, I suppose. Right? Now, Divya, I see your questions too. Of You were curious of what tarantulas would eat, so I'm glad that Alma kind of mentioned those quick. But Divya was also wondering, what are their predators? Well, even though from our perspective, Rosie's a very large spider. I mean, she's a very large individual, but out in the wilds down in South America where she's natively found, she would be a pretty easy snack. And all too often, 
Tarantulas are eaten by birds, by other mammals, and sometimes even by other tarantulas, if you can believe that or not. Now, Alma, there was another question, and I, I'm so sorry, I can't remember who asked it, but they were wondering, is she actually soft? So she does feel kind of soft. I was um, wondering that. Yeah, she's definitely soft to the touch. Um, and even the bottom of her legs um, really feel kind of, I'm trying to think of something that would feel like, um, it's very similar to kind of like feeling you rub up against your dog or your cat. Sure. Kind of that little sensation that you yep. get. Almost like a little, like a fuzzy tickle. Yeah, a fuzzy tickle. Well, I, and exactly. the reason why I say that is she doesn't weigh very much at all. Yeah. I mean, she's very light. She's hardly, you can hardly feel her little tiny feet yeah. <laughs> all over your hand. Gosh, you all are getting such a great view. Now, don't forget, send in those questions that you have myths about spiders. Some of you, I notice in the comments, are maybe a little wary of spiders. This is a perfect way to kind of break down some of those barriers, get a little bit more familiar with animals, you might be uncomfortable around since we're doing this virtually sure. only alma and i are going to be up close and personal today <laughs> so it means that all of you get to kind of sit back listen and watch because this really is a fascinating animal now i also notice sarah grace and benjamin your question was how old is rosie now alma i know rosie has kind of an interesting backstory and i I don't think we do know her age. Is that correct? We, we do not know her age, no. Um, we know that she came to us as an adult. Um, sure. So we're not really 100% sure how old she is, in fact. Gotcha. Well, and our animal ambassadors all have different backgrounds, different stories. And a lot of times, you might actually be wondering, on the opposite end of the spectrum, anyone who loves spiders might be wondering, well, can I have a tarantula as a pet? They are common in the pet trade. Alma and I wouldn't really recommend having a tarantula as a pet because even though, yes, she might be soft and she might have that fuzzy body, how Alma handled her is about the extent of the interaction that we have with our tarantulas. Yeah. They don't like to cuddle up and watch TV like your cat or dog might, <laughs> <laughs> but definitely would be a recognizable animal in the pet trade. But if you want to take our advice on it, go ahead, let them be out in the wild, learn about them here at the zoo. Because, you know, they just really, to me, they don't fit the bill of something I would like to have and share my home with. <laughs> no, no. Um, they're also pretty fragile, too, Milo. A lot of people oh, don't yes. really realize that they have this hard outer um, skeleton, this exoskeleton. And even though it's a nice hard shell for them, it's really not going to um, hold up under a lot of pressure. So, I mean, they're not something, as you notice, I let her walk on my hand versus yep. me kind of cupping her or holding her. And a good big part of that is because she is very fragile. And so therefore we want to make sure she's safe and comfortable as she's moving around. The last thing I really wanted to mention about oh, yeah. her that's a Go common ahead. myth is like most spiders, we think of them making webs. And we mentioned what she ate. What we didn't mention is the fact that she does not build a web to catch her food. Funny. So yep. tarantulas are unique in that they are ambush hunters. So a lot of times they will hide or they will burrow underground and have an opening to that burrow. And they actually use their silk, which is, you can, I don't know if you can see it really well, Milo, on this log. Oh, yeah. But you can see some of her silk strands on this log. They actually usually oh, just neat. use that silk kind of to, again, help them detect things that are getting close to them. It, you, they use it sometimes to um, be a nice soft mat in their burrow to lay on. It's really important when they're molting, which is when they shed that outer exoskeleton and they're growing a new one underneath. Sure. It kind of is where they can sit and rest while that process is happening. So that's more the purpose for her silk than to actually build a web or to catch food in it. She'll do that using just her, um, her legs. Well, and Alma mentioned the vast variety, not only of tarantulas, but spiders in general too. But Alma, you know, I just got a great question that came in. Sure. Christina and Maxim were wondering, and these two are avid Z Learner viewers. They've been watching since All the right. very beginning. So they th threw us a curveball today. Uh -oh. They were very observant. They noticed that Rosie looks like she has 10 legs, mm. not eight. So somebody was getting their counting on. Yeah. And we need to talk about those two appendages right close to her face. Are they legs? So technically, no, those are technically not legs. Those are actually part of what she uses to help her be able, again, to grasp her prey, sure. help her be able to feed it into um, her, kind of hold it onto her mouth. Now she yep. doesn't eat or chew like you and I do. She actually does have fangs underneath and those fangs are what she uses, um, a type of venom 
to inject into the prey that kind of liquefies it. It's kind of like she sucks up her food through a straw, kind of like a smoothie. That's a perfect Halloween okay. fact. Okay, yep. yep, a smoothie, <laughs> right? Okay, I don't know if I want a bug smoothie. A bug smoothie, life, but, yeah, that sounds delicious. Um, <laughs> it sounds great to Rosie. And so those legs really are for holding her prey while she is um, injecting it with that venom. And then as it is becoming paralyzed and liquefying, that is how she'll grasp it. So. Um, Good observation, Christina and yeah. Maxim. I'm really glad that you noticed that. Thanks for always asking really intelligent questions. Well, we're going to let Alma go ahead and actually put Rosie back. Right. Now, the container that you saw her in is actually her transport container. It's not where she lives all the time because out here where we are is not her typical home. She's a Chilean rosehair tarantula, so this is not her normal home. So she's going to head back into that animal ambassador building behind the scenes here in a little bit. But in the meantime, we have some more animals we'd like to introduce you to. In fact, our next one is one of my favorites. So prepare yourself for the next animal visitor. If you saw our post yesterday, you already kind of know who we're talking about. But I do want to mention, if you've been following us along on Facebook and Instagram, you've been noticing, oh, look at these decorated pumpkins. We've had some very talented staff members on our team. Some in the past and some currently on our team that have been decorating faux pumpkins, artificial pumpkins or funkins, if you want to call them that. But take a look at this 3D version. In fact, for the last week or so, almost two weeks, we've been accepting different carved pumpkins of this faux variety. So that way we, look at that. I was gonna say one of my coworkers actually carved this one. I think it turned out wonderfully. But we are going to use these to actually decorate for Boo at the Zoo. So if you have some creative members of your family, get those here ASAP, either later today or tomorrow even. And what we'll do is we'll actually place them right here in Safari Camp and you can come see them during Boo at the Zoo and check them out for yourself. Now, I think we gave Elma just enough time and she has her hands full now. Let me go ahead and turn around the camera, prepare yourself for another animal ambassador friend. Alma, who yeah. do we have here? Dillinger is one of my favorites, Milo. Dillinger oh, take a look at her. is a black rat snake. She is a female, we believe. Okay. And she is a look snake that you can find here in South Carolina, unlike our chinchillian rose tree. Oh, true. Yeah. A native. <laughs> yeah. This is a native. So very commonly found around here. Um, they can vary slightly in color, uh, depending on how dark they are, or how um, much pattern you can actually detect on them. She's really excited. This is a new, <laughs> new experience, a new place for her to explore. Um, well, we set out all yeah. the leaves for all of you to kind of get this Halloween like, theme. And she's all about the crunchy leaves. <laughs> she's like, this is a great new place to New enrichment, new textures. Right. And it's a beautiful sunny day out today at Riverbanks it, too. It is. Now, Elma, I have to mention, because you brought out a native species. And I will say, just anybody who lives here in South Carolina, even Georgia, North Carolina, right. honestly, anywhere in the Southeast here in the United States. I know we get people that tune in from all across the country, but this is probably one of the most common snakes that you would find in your yards. Is that not correct? So those of you at home, you might've seen this snake before, but Alma, this is probably one of our most asked questions about snakes. Anytime we're handling any sort of snake, is she dangerous? That's a great question. So we always like to say anything with a mouth could possibly bite. Sure. However, Dillinger here um, works regularly with handlers such as myself, as well as we even have a team of animal ambassador keepers that regularly do training with our um, animals as well as with our staff to be able to read their body language, be able to tell if they're comfortable in situations. We do expose them to different um, places, the classroom, being outdoors, yep. different sounds and noises, just to ensure that they are comfortable. And she is super comfortable right now, Milo. Clearly. <laughs> um, to make sure that they are um, definitely ready to come out and greet our guests and um, meet folks as they move around. So, so yes, she possibly could, but it is highly unlikely. She's very comfortable at the moment. Um, and she will give off um, signs if she becomes not so as well. So. Sure. Well, and when we say dangerous, I mean, dangerous is such a, a unique term to use because at the end of the day, we are so much larger than rat snakes. Sure, there might be a lot of people that are afraid of snakes or snakes might make them uncomfortable. Or at the end of the day, they just don't know a lot about snakes. What actually is dangerous to a snake is what a snake would eat. So if you think of a mouse, maybe small yep. birds, if you're a rat snake, 
you'd be definitely very dangerous <laughs> because you would be potentially a snack if you were a mouse or a bird. <laughs> but for us, uh, they're a very harmless animal. They're, in fact, you know what? I, we get the question all the time, all the time. I cannot say that enough, stress that enough. Are they poisonous? Oh, that is a And I, I specifically worded it that way. So all of you animal fans out there, don't judge me for saying, are they poisonous? It's the question we get asked, so I'm just going to repeat is. it. So Alma, break that down for us. What is it? Sure. So first of all, she is not poisonous. No snakes, in fact, are poisonous. She is what's called a constrictor, meaning that if she was to catch her prey, she would wrap her body around it and use her muscles to be able to squeeze it and hold it. Sure. Um, basically suffocating it and then she would in fact swallow it whole. Now there are a number of snakes however that are venomous, although fewer than one might think. Here in South Carolina we only have six types out of over 30 different wow. species of snake. That is a small and percentage. Only six are actually venomous. They're very, very rare to actually come across unless you are regularly outdoors. Okay. And looking for them, probably. Yeah, They're very secretive them. animals. You do have to look for them. They don't They don't want to um, use their venom. That's a lot of work for them to be able to use to protect themselves. A snake's number one defense is always to hide from, um, from any predators. That's why oftentimes they're really well camouflaged, as you can see from this black rat snake. Her, mm -hmm. her colors would be perfect for hiding. They also typically lay very still and curled in a nice ball shape. Again, that's to protect not only her head, but remember, she's got a long body, so she can't keep an eye on her tail unless she keeps it close to her. Sure. So that also helps her as well. So there are, in fact, no poisonous snakes. We actually know them as venomous. Yep. And part of that is because a venomous animal has to inject its toxin into you for you to be hurt. Again, keep in mind, she can't do that. She won't do that. So, in other words, everyone who's tuning in right now, don't worry. Alma is yep. not in danger, uh, nor am I. Yep. Dillinger is very comfortable. And Christina, I just saw your question of what are we looking at? We're looking at Dillinger, the black rat snake, which is a native species. Look at how coiled up she is around your arm though, Alma. How pretty. In fact, that is probably one of the most unique things about black rat snakes is how highly adapted they are to climbing. Yeah. In fact, homeowners out in the area might notice sometimes they will climb up the trunks of trees. They're very muscular animals and highly adapted to getting where they need to go. But if you do happen to see them on, near, around your home, don't worry, they're not there to bother you, I promise. They're there for a snack, which means that you should stay, you know, give them their room, but let them hang out there because what they're gonna be eating is probably something you don't want in your house either. You're not gonna want a mouse in your house and they would much rather eat it for you instead. That's right. What an amazing animal. Now, Alma, I also, this is my one of my favorite things to talk about with snakes because I'll, once again, I'll be honest, a lot of people don't love snakes. They're just really not their favorite. Sally. Personally, I will even be honest, I have not always been a fan of snakes, but what really yes. helped me, no. I, I had to learn more about them. Sure. And by learning more about snakes and really understanding more about them, I got to a much greater appreciation. But one of my favorite things that a lot of people don't realize and kind of makes people uncomfortable is their eyes. Now, Dillinger is moving around way, way too much right now because <laughs> it always <laughs> looks like they're staring at them. Why is that, Elma? They do not have eyelids. There's no eyelids for one, Milo. So if wow. you look closely at a snake, <laughs> there's no eyelids. There's no blinking going on. So they can't help but constantly be watching you. Um, and that's important for, again, keeping an eye out for predators more than anything else as far as prey as well. Um, but yeah, there's no eyelids on these guys. So that's why they're often looking Such at you. Such a good point. Or seem to be looking at you. They also, their pupils are um, very special. Now, hers are rounded. A lot of snakes actually are slit. Sure. And a lot of that has to do with what time she is out. She's an active um, snake during the day versus at night. Many snakes are more active at night. And that slit pupil allows them to be able to let less light in during um, sunny day and then open it up wide to let more light in at night. Okay, so they can actually expand it more than a round pupil can. Sure. So oftentimes your daytime snakes have more that rounded pupil versus your nocturnal snakes, those animals Ooh. active at night, like, <laughs> um, typically have the um, more slit. Well, shape. and that's such a fantastic fact to share. Now I will say, don't get close enough to the snakes in your backyard to see what kind of eyeballs <laughs> they have. Instead, come visit Riverbanks and head to our Aquarium and Reptile Complex and look to see if you can tell the difference, just like Alma was talking about, and see if you can tell the difference between daytime 
or nocturnal snakes and what their eyes different looks like. Oh, by the way, Teresa, thank you so much for donating. What a hefty donation. We cannot say thank you enough for supporting Riverbanks and our mission to create connections, educate just like we're doing now and impact conservation too. I did see a question come through. I think it was from Jessica. Jessica was wondering, well, how do they show affection? Do reptiles show affection in any way? Reptiles come in all sorts of different shape sizes, snakes, lizards, tortoises, turtles, crocodiles, and they all have very different ways of behaving. Snakes are not a very affectionate animal whatsoever. They're really not going to show that. It's just not in their kind of natural behaviors. Turtles and tortoises, sure, some might say that they can be a little bit more affectionate. If you've ever watched Z Learning and seen as we've scratched our big tortoises, they definitely crave touch a little bit differently. Snakes are a little bit different. And even though Dillinger is so familiar with being handled, she is obviously very comfortable and very used to it. It's not necessarily a overly natural behavior for snakes. They definitely prefer their personal space. So once again, if you ever find a snake in your backyard, whether it's venomous or non-venomous, odds are it's non-venomous, just like Alma said, but give them their personal space, let them be and let them hang out on their own. Now, Alma, I couldn't help but notice as she was getting tangled in it, you brought an extra prop. It's kind of blending in with all I, of our leaves. I did, I did. So I brought actually a shed from Dillinger. This is a snake skin. And this is actually what most people find more than a snake in sure. their backyard. Yep. This is evidence that you have a snake in your backyard, which is not a bad thing because they're gonna um, maintain or control your rodent population. But as they grow, they shed their skin on a regular basis. Typically, maybe once a month as once they're kind of full grown. It really depends on how often they eat as to whether or not they need to shed. It's also awesome. kind of like a scab. So if you yeah. ever got hurt, um, same thing with a snake. If a snake was to get injured, it would actually build that scab and it would actually shed its um, scales more often, okay, to help heal that skin and help that body grow. So when they're really little, they shed quite a bit as they grow into adults, which she is. Um, they're going to shed less frequently, okay? And it's just, again, maintaining her her body, her scales, her skin. We don't realize it, but we shed every day. <laughs> it may just not look like this, it thank goodness. Like that. I'd we be a little alarmed. <laughs> we don't shed scales, but we do exactly. shed um, body cells every day. That's what makes the dust in our homes. Oh, you're absolutely right. No, Sarah Grace <laughs> Benjamin, you were wondering how often do snake sheds? Just like Alma mentioned, it depends. Are they a full-grown adult? Are they still growing? Are they eating a lot? Are they not? You know, it takes a lot of effort to get brand new scales and kind of shut off all those old ones. So it really depends. Sometimes it can happen pretty often, um, every few weeks, every couple months. It just kind of depends. And then there's sometimes that snakes will go very long periods of time without shedding. Milo, my favorite part about a Ooh, shed, yeah. and you can see it on this one. Oh, you can? Look at that. Can you see it? Yes. Here, let's go ahead and get it to focus. Look at that. The shed that actually eye cap. So they have even a scale over their eye protecting it. And so they so will actually neat. shed even their eye caps, okay? In fact, that's often the first sign that a snake is getting ready to shed is that her eyes will look kind of milky because that scale is loosening up. And therefore, she is um, getting close to where the rest of her body will start shedding as well. What a fascinating yeah. fact. Well, Alma, thank you so much for bringing out sure. Dillinger, bringing out Rosie for us as well. I couldn't help but notice all the pumpkins that are sitting around you. This is too perfect. We got Look plenty to talk it. about. I was going to say, while we have all of you tuning in still live for Z Learning, we're going to go ahead and kind of scooch over. Alma's going to put away one of our friends. That way she can get tucked back in away for her home. Take a look at some of this creative artwork. Now, you can do anything from paint on these pumpkins, carve them. But what I want to recommend is come visit us during boo at the zoo here i'll even zoom in on the this one in the middle <laughs> boo at the zoo carve it on in this is going to be a blast of a halloween event here at the zoo if you've been to it in years past don't worry during 2020 of course we've taken the necessary precautions it's timed ticketing there'll be socially distancing masks required if socially distancing isn't possible but we encourage you all to bring out your own treat bags that way you can keep yours own and sanitize it on your own but it is going to be a great, safe, family fun activity. Check out our website. If you head to riverbanks.org, I'll actually throw the link up in our captions. So that way you can have more information there. 
but get your tickets in advance. That time ticketing is so important for us to be able to safely allow all those people come into the zoo during that family-friendly event. But it does start this Friday and actually runs through the 30th. So you can have your own plans for Halloween, but come and celebrate with us here for Boo at the Zoo. But before we go, let me go ahead and turn around this camera one more time and say, see you later, to Alma. Thanks so much, Alma, for thank, joining us. Thank you guys for having me. Wonderful to see you. And everybody, don't forget to tune in next week. We have another Lunch and Z Learn feature on Wednesday at noon. We are going to be celebrating World Lemur Day early. And you know what? I am so excited. I'm selfishly so excited because we've done a lot of Z Learning features, but we haven't done one yet, only on lemurs. So tune in next Wednesday at noon, and we will see you all then. Thanks so much, everybody. And thanks so much for tuning in live.